There are only so many games that redefine the industry. Zelda Ocarina of Time took everything we know and love about the action-adventure genre, but put it into the third dimension. Similar to Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time redefined its genre and provided the gaming world with an experience that's never been done before. It was unprecedented for its time, hence the name Ocarina of Time. It's really just a timeless game. The beginning might be slow for you modern gamers out there, but like most Zelda games, once you get warmed up and have the controls down, you'll be hooked. If you're not used to the Zelda formula, let me quickly break it down for you. You go from dungeon to dungeon with small tasks in between. Each dungeon gives you a new item that enables you to progress further on your quest to save Hyrule. There's so many reasons why this game is so special, but the main reason why I play Zelda games is specifically due to level design. The first dungeon teaches you about how the gaming mechanic works for Ocarina of Time. This tree opens his mouth and you go inside him. Inside the Deco Tree might be the first dungeon in the game, but I like to think of it more as a tutorial. Since this was the first 3D Zelda game, the developers knew that it was important to make sure gamers understood all these new mechanics. When I arrived, I noticed the web that I was required to break. It became obvious due to the bounciness of the web that I needed to get some height and enough momentum to break it. So naturally, I tried to climb this vine, but only for these spider thingies to throw me off and preventing me to climb any further. There were a couple of other places on this floor that I hadn't checked out yet, so eventually, I came across a slingshot. The game forced me how to use the slingshot in the same room because I wasn't able to leave until I could shoot down this ladder. This is a prime example of the game teaching you how to use something without spoon feeding you information. So using the information that I learned, I went back to those pesky spiders and shot their asses down. I was able to safely climb up that vine and then have enough height to break that web. That is the magic of Zelda. Everything in that dungeon existed for a reason, and I was able to learn through trial and error and just figuring shit out. Once you get through this tutorial, you leave your little forest and you go to Hyrule Fields, this seemingly endless open world. Even by today's standards, it's a pretty big world, but I would say that it's a big world disguised by a linear story. There are side quests to get you more hearts and certain items that will help you out, but it's far too linear and I don't even know if there's enough content to consider Ocarina of Time an open world game. That's not to say you don't get rewarded for exploring out of the normal path. Ocarina of Time encourages exploration and you will get rewarded for it. There are things to collect outside of heart pieces, like golden skulltulas, and you can go fishing. There are enough side quests and mini games throughout your journey to help break up these intense dungeons, like collecting the right chickens in order to get a bottle of milk from Lon Lon Ranch. I'm already getting sidetracked though, so let's get back to the main story. So after you trek the fields of Hyrule, you sneak past some guards and then you go see the princess. You look at some pictures of Mario because Zelda is a gamer apparently, and then you'll have a chat with her. Zelda puts you on a quest to find all of these medallions because you need them in order to open the Temple of Time. After going through two more dungeons and getting two more medallions, you'll catch Zelda fleeing from the castle on a horse, only to turn around and see this man, Ganondorf. At this point in the game, I already completed three dungeons. I felt pretty powerful, but Ganondorf put Link in his place and kicked his ass. This scene is a direct feeling of the true scale you feel in Ocarina of Time. I already spent hours in this game only to realize I was powerless against the main villain. Ganondorf rides off to try to get Zelda, and as you enter the Temple of Time, you realize you've made a horrible mistake. So you use those medallions to open the Temple of Time, and then you see the Master Sword, so what do you do? You pull it out, right? When Link pulled out the Master Sword, it somehow allowed Ganon to enter the Sacred Realm, which allowed him to obtain the Triforce. I can keep going, but basically, Link fucked up. Ganondorf kind of won already, and then Link traveled seven years into the future into this apocalyptic version of Hyrule. Remember that beautiful town with all the fun townspeople running around and the happy music? Now there are just zombies everywhere. Death Mountain has a fiery ring surrounding it, Zora's domain is frozen. Although the geography is the same since Link was a kid, the entire landscape of Hyrule has turned into complete chaos. When you go back to Zelda's castle, the same place where you met your girl, you instead see this skyscraper surrounded by a giant moat of lava. Just look at this. Again, Ocarina of Time gave me a sense of scale that I've never felt before in a video game. I thought to myself, how am I supposed to overcome this? But I was hooked. I beat the rest of the dungeons and eventually, 
I was strong enough to face Ganon head on. Another great example of progression in Ocarina of Time is how the game leads you to the first adult temple, the Forest Temple, but you can't enter it until obtaining the hookshot. This Metroid-style gameplay is filled to the brim in Ocarina of Time. There are plenty of scenarios where you need to backtrack using newly obtained items in order to progress through your journey, but it's always so intuitive that makes you feel like a genius as you sift through your arsenal of items. Games like Zelda and Metroid were doing this years before Ocarina of Time, but to achieve this in the 3D landscape was insane. The time traveling elements are pretty neat. There will be certain dungeons where you need to go back in time as a child to solve certain puzzles that only he can access, and then finish them off as Adult Link. You will find yourself traveling through time throughout this playthrough, hence the name, Ocarina of Time. The dungeons are also very distinct from one another. They provide their own atmosphere, from the chilling high-pitched sounds of the forest temple, to the ambiance of the water temple, to the low-pitched darkness of the shadow temple. The dungeons bring their own feel to the game, from both level design and aesthetics. Once you reach the forest temple, the first temple as an adult, the difficulty is ramped up and you realize, you ain't a kid anymore. As a kid, life was easy, there was no one really depending on you, but once the plot twists and you're an adult, you can feel the weight on your shoulders. You're aware that you're the only one who can save the day, and that makes the stakes feel that much greater. Back to gameplay, the combat specifically, Ocarina of Time does show its age. It was one of the first games to feature a lock-on system, and that was mostly due to a 3D view without a dedicated stick for camera. Within combat, you basically just shield, dodge, and attack, but it's pretty satisfying to rip your opponents to shreds. Despite aged combat, the boss battles are still pretty epic, because I like to think of them as one giant puzzle. You're typically required to use the same item that you obtained that dungeon, and then use that item to kill your boss. The bosses serve as another example of how scary the odds feel, because they're larger than life. They seem like they're unbeatable, but then you figure out how to beat them, and you feel like you're just the man. On the topic of feeling like the odds are against you, let's go over Ganon's castle, because Ganon's castle is a really, really big deal. It's a big deal beyond just a story and scale perspective. It's a test of every mechanic you've learned throughout your journey into one final showdown. What makes Ganondorf so threatening is beyond the fact that he's so powerful, there's a mystery to him. You only encounter him a couple of times in your journey, and once you're an adult, you know he's waiting for you at the castle, but you don't see him until the end of the game. Before you can even approach Ganondorf, you have to go through a series of rooms that serve as mini-dungeons filled with puzzles that incorporate every item that you've ever obtained. Nintendo got very creative through all of these mini-dungeons. Once you complete all of the mini-dungeons, the barrier will break, and you'll be on your way to defeat Ganondorf. The suspense builds as you climb the tower, with the music getting louder and louder as you climb up. Some of the old mini-bosses greet you on your way. Once you finally reach Ganondorf, you realize he was playing the organ the whole time. I know this sounds cheesy, but I was freaking out at the time. Let's all remember though, this is not the same little boy who got his ass kicked by Ganondorf. This is Adult Link, and he is prepared. You defeat Ganondorf, he coughs up blood, and then the story's over. So you think. Ganondorf forces his own tower to collapse as a desperate attempt in ending your life, so you need to make it out of there in time with Zelda. This is arguably the most memorable experience when the castle's collapsing and you're trying to flee it with Zelda. The suspense just builds and builds and builds. Once you escape to the bottom, you watch the tower collapse and it seems like Ganondorf is dead forever. Well, you would, uh, you would be wrong, because Ganondorf actually jumps out of nowhere, and he shows his true form. Ganon! Now this is one of the most iconic boss battles of all time. This David vs. Goliath battle ends up with Link stabbing Ganon in the head, and Hyrule is saved! You end up getting the girl, Mario and Luigi drink together in harmony, and all is well. The ending is actually nuts, all of the characters you meet throughout your journey end up partying together, it's just a great time. Call me biased, tell me I'm drinking the nostalgic Kool-Aid, I don't care. There will never be a greater ending to a game than Ocarina of Time. What ultimately separates the Zelda series beyond just great level design and puzzles is the constant feeling of scale and progression. You start out the game with no items, no shield, no sword, you're literally powerless. To go from that to the hero of time is an indescribable feeling. 
Although the main objective is to defeat Ganon, and it's beyond satisfying stabbing him in the face, that's not even what I was focused on when I was playing this game. I felt so in the moment, whether it's capturing lost chickens in Kakariko Village, or trying to get through the Shadow Temple's drum boss. The world is just so interactive that no matter what you're doing, you always feel like you're getting stronger and overcoming obstacles. I play video games to gain a feeling like I've achieved something. That's why Ocarina of Time means so much to me. You gain a sense of achievement and a sense of accomplishment. Ocarina of Time follows the fundamentals of growth. You defy odds and ultimately, due to your intelligence, courage, and diligence, you come out on top and stab Ganon in the face. Ocarina of Time is the first Zelda game that I've ever played, so I may show some bias. The time traveling aspect within the game echoes to real life because it takes me back to a time when I was in first grade and I was trying to find the sword in Kokiri Forest. I'll tell you one thing, the problem solving elements back in Ocarina of Time were far more educational than whatever the hell I was learning back then. So if you're a responsible parent, have your little ones play Ocarina of Time. It will teach them the essential mechanics on how to grow up. Long live Ocarina of Time. The GOAT. The greatest of all time.